The holiday of Hanukkah is upon us. Uh, we're going to have eight days of celebration, eight days of spinning the dreidel, eight days of eating way too fatty, oily foods, eight days of lighting the menorah, and eight days of celebration and reflection on the tremendous miracle that happened to our antecedents uh, in the second century before the Common Era. What I want to do today is to share an overview of the entire holiday, uh, the history, uh, the holiday, how it was developed, the various themes that make a, 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 an appearance on this festival, some of the laws. We're really going to try to cover it all, or at least try to cover much of it, you know, you know within the time frame allotted to, to arm us with sufficient information to be well-equipped to participate, to enjoy, to experience the holiday of Hanukkah, which is swiftly upcoming. And of course, the story begins with the Greeks. Alexander the Great is one of the most, of course, the greatest military strategists and tacticians of all time. And by the time uh, he is 32, he's already dead, and he's conquered much of the known world. After he dies, of course, there is a lot to divvy up, and eventually... Uh, there's three various empires that emerge from the original Greek empire of Alexander. And what's very important to stress uh, with respect to the Hanukkah story is that when the Greeks conquered a land, it was about more than just territorial conquest. It was about infusing the conquered land with a certain ideas, with certain perspectives, with certain philosophy and culture known, of course, as Hellenism. When they were conquer a land, it was more about just having more territories under their control. It was about infusing these territories with their ideals, with their morals, uh, with what uh, the Torah calls something very beautiful. The Torah acknowledges that there's something very special about, about the Greeks and what they represent. Uh, that said, there is a definite conflict between the ideals of the Greeks and the ideals of Torah. Uh, the Greek philosophy is all about being very rational, which we are too, but their rationality extends to a certain point and no further. It's about the physical realm. It's about making things very beautiful, very stunning, very intellectually appealing to a point. And we have that rational intellectual perspective too. So there's a certain natural overlap between us and the Greeks, but we take it to kind of the supernatural realm to the godly realm as well. So they come and they conquer much of the world and all the places that they uh, uh, that submit to them are infused with uh, art and architecture and language. And of course, the Greek obsession with the human body, they build gymnasiums, they start throwing those discs around, uh, they embrace the human body in its purest forms. So, of course, you can still see, still see today all the various uh, statues of these Greek uh, heroes, uh, fully nude, as as we, 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 uh, we know. And, of course, in Judaism, we're much more focused about the soul. Yes, it's important for us to, you, know, you got to tend to your body. You have to live in a physical world. You have to embrace that reality to a certain extent, but that could become an inhibitor to the spiritual realm. If someone's just focused on this world, on their body and the physical, that may in fact preclude them from connecting to God. You know, we talk about a mitzvah. A mitzvah is an act that you do with your body, but it's an act that is desirous. It's really from the realm of your soul. We believe that you could transcend this world and then in fact we could have a connection with the divine, with this invisible spiritual realm. These two worlds can meet and can be fused together. So we have now this kind of clash of cultures that's going to last for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, Alexander is going to conquer Israel and going to conquer Judea, was called Judea at the time. It's going to conquer Jerusalem and move on further east. After he dies, the empire gets uh, splintered and the land of Judea is going to be under the Ptolemians, the Egyptian Greeks, uh, for about a hundred or so years. And 
all along this time, there's going to be a rise in the land of Israel of, Jew, of Jews who are called misyavnim. Uh, the Hebrew word for Greek uh, for Greece is yavan. And people that want to become like yavan are called misyavnim, known to us as Hellenists. These are Jews who are enamored with their Greek overlords and buy into their ideology and want to incorporate it into Judea, into uh, the Jews around them. So that's going to be like kind of an internal struggle between what became known as the Pharisees and then the Hellenists. And then later on, the Hellenists are going to rebrand themselves as the Sadducees. And there's going to be kind of like this tension that's going to exist internally within the Jewish people for the next several hundred years. So you have the internal tension coupled with the external tension the Jews are going to have with their Greek overlords. And that's really going to reach a crescendo by the Hanukkah story. So initially, the Jews are under the Ptolemyans. And the Ptolemyans, they are not going to be as militant in pushing the Hellenistic agenda. Of course, they're going to build some gymnasiums and they're going to do some things that are going to contribute to the advancement of Greek, of Greek culture in the land of Israel, but it's not going to be as aggressive. They're not going to promote it as strongly as some of the other Greek empires. Now, in the year 198, uh, there's going to be a war and the Seleucid Greeks are going to capture Judah. So if you kind of know a little picture of the map here, the Ptolemyans, the Egyptian Greeks, well, they're in Egypt. And then you have the Seleucid Greeks in Assyria and kind of sandwiched between the two is you have Judah. Israel is always kind of at the crossroads of, of Asia, Europe, and Africa. And therefore, there's been going to be various skirmishes between these two Greek uh, empires, and eventually, it's going to be picked up by the Assyrians. And Antiochus III becomes, or Antiochus the Great, of course, as he likes to be called, he's, he's going to become the emperor over the land of Judah, and then his son Antiochus IV in 175 is going to become the emperor, he's like, I'm not just Antiochus IV, you could call me Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Great, Antiochus the God Manifest, he's going to put statues of himself in the temples of all religious people under his rule, everyone's got to bow down to me, because I'm the new God here, uh, he's going to be dancing nude at all these lavish Hellenistic entertainments that he commissioned, and he's going to begin to forcefully and aggressively promote the Hellenistic agenda. And he's also going to do some other unconscionable things like meddling in the internal Jewish affairs. So, for example, the most important spiritual office of the Jewish people is the high priest, is the Kohen Gadol. And he's the one, after all, who's in the temple, and he's part of this exclusive family going back to Aaron. He's going to be involved. He's the, at the spiritual epicenter of the Jewish people. He's the one that the Jewish people look up to as their spiritual guide. Well, who's that? Who, who decides who, who becomes the high priest? Now, Antiochus says, it's me. I'm in charge. And I'll give it to the highest bidder or I'll give it to the person who will help me in advancing my agenda. So there's a righteous high priest named Chonyo and he has a Hellenized brother whose name is now Jason. Not a very Jewish sounding name for a high priest. Comes along and Tyke says, okay, I'm, I'm going to swap. Now, now Chonyo, you've been uh, retired, uh, and now there's a new Kohen Gadol in town who's going to help me. He's going to build all kinds of gymnasiums. He's going to be a, a tax collector and a political proxy to help me, and he's going to help accelerate the goal of Hellenization. And things kind of really are bad, but they get worse. And sometimes, you know, people are able to stomach a certain degree of tyranny until you push them a little too far and then they go crazy and they start dumping the tea into the harbor and getting a little bit more militant and that's basically what happened about seven years after Antiochus assumes his rulership he begins to enact severe restrictive edicts against many core Jewish practices he says okay if you guys are not willing to buy into my Hellenized agenda I'm going to force your hand and he specifically picks certain mitzvos, certain commandments that are very much closely associated with the Jewish identity and Jewish continuity. And he says those things are banned. And if you do that, 
well, we're going to kill you. One of those things, Torah study. You study Torah, we're going to kill you. You observe Shabbos or Jewish holidays, well, that's a punishable by, that's punishable by death. Kosher laws, laws of circumcision. This is going to be the first time of many times where circumcision is going to be banned. The laws of Nida. All these things that are so vital for Jewish continuity and Jewish identity, he says, they are out uh, of the picture. No longer could be allowed. If you do that, we're going to execute you. If a child was circumcised, the barbarous Greeks would take the mother and the child and throw them both off a cliff. They, w- they would force feed pigs to the Jews. It was common that uh, brides were snatched from their weddings and violated by the officers. They even installed a pagan statue uh, to the god Zeus in the temple. He commissioned sacrifices for this. This is obviously just, just terrible uh, treatment of his Jewish subjects. And of course, for the Jews, there's nothing uh, that is a greater uh, sacrilege than idolatry, much less idolatry, bringing it to the temple. And this kind of really gets uh, intolerable and unbearable. And amongst the Jewish people, the majority of the Jews, they are heroes and they are martyrs. And we have the story, of course, of the dreidel, where they would go hide in the caves, study Torah, and then the Greek inspectors are coming and they find him and they just put, they hide the books and start saying, hey, we're playing dreidel, we're playing cards, right? Where we, we were not studying Torah. And then you have uh, all kinds of, of, of stories of people who are willing to forfeit their lives and not capitulate to the Greeks. A very famous story that's told uh, in Jewish sources uh, and in other sources, contemporaneous sources of Hana and her seven sons. They say, okay, well, why don't you worship idolatry? And, and the first son says, no, kill me. And he kills the first son, the second son, the third son, fourth. all seven sons. Uh, they all die in martyrdom. And this shows that the Jewish people, you know, have a penchant for martyrdom. And maybe they were lax to a certain degree in maintaining their religion and the religious conviction. But when the Gentile comes, puts the gun to the head, that kind of evokes a certain spirit of determination, of commitment with with what it means to be Jewish and what we stand for. And that indeed is, is, is something which is present in all times of history. It's like when we forget that we're Jews, sometimes the Gentiles will say, okay, well, forget that you're Jews. And, no, no, no. We can forget that we're Jews ourselves. If you force us to forget, we're going to remember it. And that's kind of a theme that really plays out in the run-up to the actual Hanukkah story. But eventually, a revolt is mounted. Uh, the actual origins of the revolt is somewhat of a question. We know the family that started it. Uh, that's, of course, the Maccabees. Uh, we have Matisyahu, who's a priest. And one story goes how in the city of Modin, the band of Greek soldiers come, they erect an altar, and they put a pagan god there. And they say, okay, who is willing to sacrifice a pig for this God. And of course, the Jews say, no, we're not going to do it. And then one local Hellenized Jew says, okay, where do I sign? I'm in. So he ascends to the platform and he's going to sacrifice the pig. And Matisyahu, this venerated old sage and Kohen, he grabs a sword that he had hid under his robes. And in a fit of zealotry, he takes the sword and he slays the traitor. And then he turns into the Greeks. The Greeks are obviously very surprised. And their guard has been down. He starts attacking them. And the mass of people pounce upon them, slay them all. And thus begins the Maccabean revolt. There's an alternative story that tells of Judah Maccabee was one of the sons of Matisyahu, one of the five sons of Matisyahu who led the revolt. And the story goes that his sister was getting married. And, of course, a wedding is a happy affair unless it means that the bride is going to be snatched and violated and assaulted by the local governor. So what they did is they would have the brides dressed up in tatters and rags to make her less appealing, which is just a terrible, it's a terrible thing. 
and Judah Maccabee is by his sister's wedding and he sees her wearing the raj and he says, this is ridiculous. Why are we giving into this? Let's mount the revolt. And that's how uh, an alternative storyline of how the revolt began. Regardless, after three years, and of course the revolt grows, this is a very long story, but the short Cliff Notes version is that the, the, the revolt starts with the, you know, band, a family that grows and it's constantly growing and they're winning improbable victory after improbable victory. They're engaging in guerrilla warfare. The Greeks initially don't view this very seriously. They constantly send their better generals with more reinforced legions. And uh, the war actually does not end for 25 years. There's various escalations, but after 25 years, all the Greeks are kicked out of Israel. But within three years, the Jews managed to liberate various cities, including the most important city of them all, the city of Jerusalem. Along the way, there's many stories of heroism. There's many stories of martyrdom. There's, uh, of course, the story of Yehudas, or Yehudit, uh, she was uh, various different accounts of who she was. According to one opinion, she was actually the daughter of one of the high priests. According to another opinion, that she was just some wealthy widow. It's not clear exactly that their accounts are not all in agreement as to who exactly she was, but she was very a very noble woman, and she goes into the Greek camp. According to one, she was a bride, and therefore she was going to the to, to, to the tent, so to speak, of the general. According to another one, she 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 told the general, she told the soldiers, "Listen, I know the secret way to get into the city. It's clear we're going to lose, and therefore I'll just tell you how to get in, so you don't you can move on from the siege." Regardless, she gets in there. Either she gives them wine, or she gives them cheese, and she puts them to sleep. She takes his sword or her sword, different accounts, but regardless, she decapitates. The Greek general, and then she takes his head and calmly puts it in her bags and wraps it up and walks back to uh, the city. And uh, then they take uh, they take his head and put it on a spike, and all the Greek soldiers freak out and they all escape and they're routed. That's the basic story of Yehudas. Of course, it's embellished and there's various different ways. You know, the details are not uh, universally agreed upon, but in very very ancient sources we have the story of of this individual. But that's just one of many stories uh, of improbable victories, you know, where this uh, David and Goliath story, where you have the, the Jews who aren't really a formalized nation, the Greeks that have 200 years of world domination behind them, and the Jews eventually win. After three years, the Maccabees succeed in recapturing the temple, and... They rededicate it and they are reinstituting everything that was stopped once the Greeks got involved. And they're trying to find oil for the menorah. And it's important to have a certain kind of oil and a certain oil that's not ritually impure, that hasn't been defiled. The Greeks, well, they shattered all the oil that when they got there. Every little flask of oil that was used for one night of the menorah lighting, they would shatter it either because they wanted to just defile it or because they thought maybe the Jews were hiding gems and diamonds in it. Regardless, there were there weren't really any flasks of oil left. And then one guy moved aside one of the tiles and found a pure, unadulterated, intact flask of oil that they used to light the menorah. And though it was only sufficient to last for a single day, a miracle happened. And it lasted for eight days, granting them sufficient time to get the new virgin olive oil to be produced and to be transported. According to some opinions, the reason why it took eight days was because they had to get it from the northern parts of Israel. It was a four-day travel there and then a four-day travel back. Alternatively, it's because the entire nation or many parts of the nation were ritually impure and therefore, they're not even able to handle something without conveying their impurity to it. Of course, the draconian labyrinthine laws of impurity are a separate su- subject. But suffice it to say that if someone is impure, what they handle can become impure. So therefore, they cannot handle the olives. And therefore, you need seven days for that to, for that process to be, to, to be commenced. 
and therefore it took eight days the day following where they could produce the new oil. It's interesting, there's a whole question about this. Well, if the Jews were impure, well, how could they light the menorah? Because they would convey impurity to the menorah too, or to the oil. So uh, various answers are given. Either, well, most of the Jews were impure, but not all the Jews were impure. Alternatively, they actually fashioned a brand new menorah made out of wood, which is a material that doesn't isn't susceptible to impurity. And then they use a stick, which, uh, again, is a buffer between them and the candles, which prevented it from becoming impure. But regardless, after this amazing miracle where one flask of oil designated to last for one day lasted for eight days, the sages of Israel established the holiday of Hanukkah to remember the great victory of the Jews over their enemies and additionally to remember the miracle of the oil, but most importantly to memorialize the preservation of the Jewish religion and of Torah, and of the Jewish nation, and of the Jewish character and identity, in spite of their opponents. The Maccabees recaptured the monarchy. They established the Maccabean dynasty, known as the Hasmoneans, the Hashmonaim. It lasted for a long time, uh, even though uh, some time later, which is one of the sad, tragic episodes of, of, of Jewish history, this family that became famous because of their opposition... To the Hellenists, they themselves became Hellenized several generations later. They weren't Hellenized because Hellenized, no one was Hellenized anymore. The Hellenists rebranded themselves as the Sadducees. Because after the Maccabean revolt, Hellenists were not viewed in the most positive light, but those people, they still existed. The Jews who wanted to be like the Greeks. But then they said, oh, you know what? We're not Hellenists anymore. Call us Sadducees. And now they're Sadducees and therefore... It's the same people with the same ideals, but it's a more palatable term. It's kind of ironic and tragic that the very family that began the revolt against the Hellenists, they themselves, several generations later, became Sadducees themselves, and therefore things didn't end up as positively as it could have ended up, and eventually that whole family was assassinated by Herod because once the Romans came in and... The Romans came in to settle a dispute between two Hasmonean sons who were vying for the throne. So they invited Pompey in to mediate their disputes. Then Pompey said, okay, I'm I'm here and I'm here to stay. And then the Romans, they they, they, they took charge. And then they appointed, eventually they appointed Herod. And Herod said, well, I'm king of Israel, but I don't want any renegade Hasmoneans to question that. So he found every Hasmonean and he assassinated them all. And the Talmud says that there's no remnant of this family, sadly, anymore. That the whole family was killed. There's there's no one left. But that's the uh, general overview of the holiday. I want to read to you uh, a statement. Uh, The Rambam, Maimonides, his introduction where he kind of brings it all together, the whole story of, uh, uh, of the holiday and of Hanukkah and the laws that we have as a result. I'm going to read it in English, even though it's written in Hebrew. This is uh, chapter 3 of the laws of Megillah and Hanukkah. During the Second Temple, when the kings of Greece decreed all kinds of decrees against, against the Jewish people and tried to disrupt their religion and did not allow them to study Torah and to observe the mitzvos, and they extended their hands in their money and in their daughters, and they entered the temple and they damaged it and they defiled the sacred. And it was very difficult for the Jews and they felt very constricted as a result of these Greeks, and they were pressed very hard until the Almighty, the God of their forefathers, had mercy upon them and saved them from their hands. And the sons of the Hashmonaim, of the Hasmoneans, the high priests, they overcame the Greeks and they killed them and they rescued Israel from their hands and they established a king from the priests, from the Kohanim, and the kingdom and hegemony returned to Israel for more than 200 years until the destruction of the Second Temple. And when Israel overcame their enemies and they destroyed them, that was on the 25th day of the month of Kislev. And they entered the temple and didn't find any pure oil. And they only found one vial, one flask of oil. And they had only sufficient oil to last for one day. And they lit it. They lit the, te- they lit the candles of the menorah and it lasted for eight days until they were able to bring new oil 
from new uh, squeezed olives. And as a result of this, the sages of that day decreed that those eight days that begin with the 25th day of Kislev, these will be days of celebration, days of hallel, days of thanks to the Almighty, days that we light the menorah at night at the entrance of your home for all these eight days to show and to reveal the miracle that happened to our forefathers. And these days are called Hanukkah. You're not allowed to give a eulogy on Hanukkah. And you're not allowed to fast on Hanukkah, like the days of Purim. And this is a mitzvah. This is a mitzvah of rabbinic origin, like the reading of the Megillah. This, of course, is a mitzvah that came after the Torah was sealed. And therefore, it's not included in the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. It's one of the seven rabbinic mitzvahs that came afterwards. And in addition, we also, there's mitzvahs that we have to read various uh, things uh, in the liturgy, um, including uh, during the Shemona Esri, during the Amidah prayer, and during the Berkat HaMazon, during the benching, after a bread meal. We also highlight this holiday and all talk about all the various miracles that happened in a prayer called the al Hanisim prayer. I want to read that as well because it shows another angle of the uh, of the story. And we say, quote, In the days of Matesiao, the son of Yochanan, the high priest, who was the Hasmonean and his sons, when the Greek, evil Greek kingdom stood up upon your nation, Israel, to make them forget your Torah and to make them go away from the laws that you are desirous of. So again, well, we see the magnitude of the challenge here. The Greeks wanted us to forget the Torah. What happens when the Jews forget the Torah? We lose our identity as a Jewish nation, and that's it. The entire experiment of the Jewish people ends. Right? This was an existential threat to our nation. Had the Greeks prevailed, had they triumphed, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be studying Torah. That would be something that would have been uh, gone extinct thousands of years ago. And therefore, the fact that we're alive today, it's not just a celebration of events of the past, but it's also a recognition and appreciation of the fact that we have continuity, we're still here, we're still present, and we still have a say, we we still exist as a nation. That's only thanks to this event. Continues the prayer. And you, reference to the Almighty, with your great mercy, you stood up with them in their time of sorrow, you wage their wars, you judge their judgments, you avenge their vengeance, you gave the mighty in the hands of the weak, the many in the hands of the few, the impure in the hands of the pure, the wicked in the hands of the righteous, the wanton sinners in the hands of those that study Torah, and for you, you made a great and holy name in your world, and for your nation Israel, you made a salvation and a redemption as great as the day today. And afterwards, your children came to the temple, they cleared it out, they purified it, they lit the candles in your the courtyard of your holiness, and they established the eight days of Hanukkah to thank you, to praise your great name. So why is this wonderful holiday called Hanukkah? So the word Hanukkah is from the word to, that means dedication or inauguration. Uh, for example, we have the term Hanukkah HaMizbeach, the dedication of the Mizbeach, the dedication of the altar. And some have suggested that when the Greeks enter the temple, either they destroy the altar or they usurp the altar. They took it for idolatry and therefore they rendered it invalid. Regardless, it had to be rebuilt and rededicated anew. And as a result, they called the holiday Hanukkah, Hanukkah or Hanukkah, which refers to the dedication of the temple and of the altar. In fact, there's an amazing midrash that talks about the mitzvah of the menorah. The menorah, of course, is one of the vessels in in the temple. The difference between the menorah that we have and the menorah that exists in the temple was that, of course, that one was made by Moses. There's other differences, and that's made of solid gold. Uh, but that had seven branches, whereas as ours has nine or eight plus one. But there's an amazing midrash that uh, invokes the story of Hanukkah with the dedication of the temple. When the temple was dedicated in, in Parshas uh, Nasso, we read about how all the 
all the presidents, all the leaders of all the tribes would, would bring these amazing contributions to the temple for the dedication. Well, which family was not included? That was the family of Cohen, the family of, of, of Aaron, because they, they weren't part of the tribes because they, they, they were the priests after all. And in Parshas Bahaloscha, in that Parsha, it begins where God tells Moses, Moshe, Moses, go speak to Aaron and tell him to light the menorah. And the Midrash tells us something very interesting. It says that after Aaron saw all the offerings of the Nasim of the heads of the tribe, he felt bad because after all the Kohanim, they weren't part of that. And therefore, the Almighty is sending him this message. Right after that story is completed, it tells, he tells them, I promise you, you have something much greater. You have the menorah. And says the Medrash, which menorah is he referring to? He's not just referring to the actual menorah in the temple. He's referring to the episode of his descendants, the Hasmoneans, the Maccabees, who are Kohanim, direct descendants of, of Aaron, and the menorah that they're going to kind of erect, and the tremendous transformation and rededication and inspiration that his descendants are going to bring about to the Jewish people. It's almost as if what he's telling him, according to the Midrash, is that when the when the presidents of the tribe made a great contribution, they contributed they contributed items of value, whereas the Hasmoneans they dedicated their heart themselves to to the cause, and therefore as a result, that's even greater. Right? The, the future contribution of the Kohanim is going to be even greater towards this menorah, so to speak, and. A third answer for why it's called Hanukkah is because the word Chanu, or like Chania, means to settle or to cease. And Ka, the last two letters, are the, the equal numerically 25. The Chaf is 20 and the He is 5. And therefore, they ceased on the 25th. That's kind of, if you put those words together, they ceased, either they ceased the war or they ceased work, like there's a tradition to stop working uh, for the time where we light the menorah. That happened on the 25th. So just briefly, what are the laws of lighting the menorah? So the, the, uh, when you light the menorah, you say two blessings every night. The blessing of lighting the menorah and the blessing of thanking God for the miracles that he did to our forefathers on these days and years past. On the first night of Hanukkah, you add a third blessing, the blessing of Shehechianu, where you thank God for bringing us back to this time, to giving us life uh, and Again, revisiting the holiday of Hanukkah. And there are three tiers of this mitzvah, according to the Talmud. The most simple way to do it, the obligation, is what's called ner ish ubeso. One candle per home, regardless of how many people live in that home. Says the Talmud, if someone is vigilantly pursuing mitzvahs, if someone is a mahadrim, then they light one candle per individual in the home. And that's every night. And then there's something called mehadrim, minimahadrim. Of all the people that are the most desirous of mitzvahs in that group, the select few that are even more desirous, those people, there's a dispute. According to Beis Shammai, according to the Academy of Shammai, you light eight candles the first night, and then every night you subtract one candle. There's no one who does that today, because we all go like the Academy of Hillel. You light one candle the first night, a second candle the second night, and so on until on the eighth night you light eight candles candles. Uh, we add a shamish as well, the, the middle candle that's not part of the mitzvah. That is only because there's a prohibition against enjoying the actual light of the menorah for illumination purposes. In fact, you cannot even use the light of menorah to study Torah. Suppose you didn't have electricity. All you have is candles. Let's imagine the electricity goes out. You cannot go and say, okay, I'm going to eat dinner or I'm going to study Torah with the light of the menorah. You're not allowed to. And therefore, you add a shamish. So in case you do use a little bit of the light, you'll say, well, that came from the extra candle. That's why we add the shamish. And after the you light the candle, there's a mitzvah to watch the candles, to sit and watch them, to help publicize the miracle. And you keep them lit, says the Talmud, until the last people have left the marketplace. So you start it at nighttime, where it's kind of like in the twilight zone. It's about uh, 5.50 or so, a little bit before six o'clock here in Houston, Texas, and you keep it lit for a minimum of about a half hour afterwards. 
Now, there's some stringent laws that apply in this particular mitzvah. So the Ramam tells us that the mitzvah of Ner Chanukah, the mitzvah of the light of, of Chanukah, is a very cherished mitzvah, exceedingly cherished. And someone has to be very careful in it because through this mitzvah, you're able to publicize the miracle that the Almighty did to, to us and to increase praise and appreciation to the Almighty for the miracles that he, that he had done for us. And then he says something very surprising. Even if you don't have what to eat and you are being supported by charity funds, you either borrow or you sell the shirt on your back to be able to buy oil to light the menorah. It's such a precious mitzvah. You got to do everything everything you can to fulfill that mitzvah. In fact, once the time to light the candles has arrived, there's a prohibition against studying Torah even, certainly not eating dinner. It means if, because we're so concerned you might miss it, the rabbis instituted a restriction against doing anything besides for lighting the candles, even if that is studying Torah, because you say, hey, studying Torah is the greatest thing. Yes, but if you do that and you forget the mitzvah, that's a major problem. And therefore, there's a prohibition against doing that. And in fact, according to one opinion, you cannot even eat for a half hour before the time to light because you may get consumed in the meal and forget about lighting on time. So there's a few more uh, questions that I want to ask to kind of broaden our surveying of the themes of the festival, of the holiday. And I want to ask two questions and kind of use that as a springboard to dig in a little bit deeper on into the eight days of Hanukkah. So first of all, one of the major questions that's asked is that if you kind of look at the story in big picture, you have a military battle and a war between two uh, asymmetrical powers. You have a mighty empire and a ragtag group of Jews in a guerrilla warfare. Well, obviously, the advantage will go to the more organized, better equipped, better trained, more numerous army. And yet, miraculously, Jews win. That's one miracle. And then you have a much different miracle, the miracle of of the oil that was supposed to light for only one day and lasted for eight. That's also a miracle, but a very different kind of miracle. And the question is, why was the mitzvah of the Hanukkah candles, why was that oriented around perpetuating the more, what we would call maybe the more minor miracle and not the more major miracle of the military victory? That's one question. Another question, it's one of maybe the most famous question in all of Jewish literature is that if the miracle, if the candle was anyhow supposed to last for one night and it lasted for eight, well, how many days of miracle do you have? You have seven days of miracle because it was supposed to last for one night. And therefore, why do we have eight days of celebration of the miracle when really the miracle was only for seven days? Because the first day, well, there was enough oil for it to last for one day anyhow. That's one of the most famous questions, maybe the most famous question in all of Jewish literature. So, so, so the first question first, why are we highlighting the miracle of the oil and not the military uh, victory? Why is that not per- perpetuated in the mitzvah? So there's a few different ways to answer that question. Uh, for one, had we focused and memorialized the military victory, there could have been several downsides to using that approach. For one, we could have forgotten about God. We could have perpetuated the myth that it was our bravery, it was our military genius that won up the Greeks. We could have forgotten all about God's role. And I would argue that uh, there's a very similar military conflict that happened in recent times where that in fact happened. In the 1967 war, the Jews were outmatched. We were outmatched, we were outgunned, all the military advantage were to our Arab enemies. And there was a miraculous military victory where the Jews, the Israelis, destroy 419 Egyptian planes and lose zero. It's things that are not imaginable. Yet, well, how do we perpetuate that miracle? 
by talking about the might of the Israeli Air Force. Yes, they deserve their praise, but we forgot about God in that miracle. And that may have happened if we had focused on the miracle of defeating the Greeks. And I also think it would have created a false equivalence between the Jews and their adversaries. We want to kind of accentuate what makes us unique and special and not saying, hey, we did the Greek thing better than the Greeks. They fought with us and we fought back even better and we won. If we focus on the miracle of the oil, it's like a spiritual miracle. It's a miracle that has to do with the temple. It has to do with the mitzvah. It has to do with the things that the Greeks came to oppose us. And we say, not to say, hey, we beat them on their terms, but we beat them on our terms. We beat them because of the oil, so to speak, and what the oil represents, and that's able to kind of sharpen the actual grand takeaway from the festival. This was a spiritual war. Yes, it was fought primarily in the battlefields, but ultimately with the miracle of the candle, we're remembering that it's the light of Torah, it's the light of our nation, that is what really brought us the victory and the salvation that it engendered. There's another answer to this question, interesting idea, that in many times in the Torah, the Almighty promises that the Jewish people will be an eternal nation. We have that in the bank. That's guaranteed. The Almighty promised, and he keeps his word. So therefore, there's no way for the Greeks to have defeated us militarily and destroyed us because then they would have destroyed the whole nation, and that would be against the Almighty's promise. So therefore, the military victory had to happen. But the mir- the victory of the, uh, the 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 miracle the miracle of the of the oil didn't have to happen because there's no promise that God made that you'll have oil every night. Sometimes, I guess, if you're able to fill it, fulfill it, okay. Either use impure oil might be allowed under certain circumstances, or don't use oil. But that wasn't promised. That was an added benefit. That was the Almighty's batshish. He gave us something extra we didn't deserve. And therefore, he shows us, you know what? He loves us, doesn't forget about us. And that is something that we have to to remember as well. It's important for us, of course. The Almighty saved us. We have to thank him for that. But you know what? He was already obligated to, so to speak, because of his earlier promises. This other miracle that he did just because he loves us is even more important because it shows us that he cares about us and is invested in us. The second question, why do we have an eight-day celebration when really there's only a miracle for seven days? So this question is known as the question of the Beis Yosef. Beis Yosef is the name of a book written by Rabbi Yosef Cairo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. He asked this question, and in fact, it's a very famous question, and someone wrote a whole book with 500 answers to this one question. But I'm going to share only seven answers. The first three answers come from the Beis Yosef himself, from Rabbi Yosef Cairo himself. The first answer is that they realized that they had only one flask of oil and they knew it would only last for one day and it would take them eight days to replenish the oil. Therefore, they divided the flask into eight equal parts. And the first night they poured an eighth of the usual amount and it lasted the whole night. And the second night they did the same thing. Meaning that there was a miracle every single night for all eight nights. And therefore, they celebrate the miracle for eight nights. That's the first answer. The second answer that he suggests is that they poured in all of the oil into the menorah. But then they looked at the flask and it was still full. And that was the miracle. And the next night they did the same thing. And it was still full again. And again, there was a miracle every night. Alternatively, they lit the candle the whole night and then they get to the morning and they look at the vial that holds the oil and the oil is still full. So they just kept on lighting it uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the duration. Other answers are that the first day we celebrate the fact that we actually found the oil or that the first day is celebration of the re- rededication of the temple. Alternatively, the Greeks wanted a ban bris meal circumcision. Well, how many days do you wait? You wait eight days, and therefore we say, okay, we're make yes, the miracle was seven days, but let's make it an eight-day celebration to remember the fact that now we could do bris milah unmolested. Uh, and the seventh answer I'll offer is that that year they missed the Sukkot celebration, which is a few months before uh, Hanukkah. We have Sukkot. Because the temple was inoperable, they missed out the whole festival. 
and eight days of Sukkot, he said, you know what, we're going to make in eight days of Hanukkah to be able to make up for those days that we missed. Regardless, there's a lot of answers to this question. Like I said, there's a book called Yemei Shemona, which means eight days. And that book is written just on this one subject with 500 answers. I want to end off with a meta idea about the difference between the Greeks and the Jews and what they represent. And I think we'll kind of hopefully create a nice little bow on the ideas of Hanukkah that we've discussed thus far. In the second verse in the Torah, we read that the land was tohu vavohu. It was empty. It was desolate. There was darkness on the surface of the deep. And the wind of God was sweeping over or was hovering over the water. It's a very strange verse describing this primordial state of the world. But there was emptiness. There was darkness. There was desolation, there was a void, there's all kinds of things. Says the Midrash, it describes four things. And these four themes of emptiness, or four terms, it describes four terms of emptiness and desolation that each one of those refer to a dark period in Jewish history. There was a dark period under the Babylonians. There was a dark period under the Medes, the Persians. And when it says vechoshech and darkness in the verse, it's referring to the state of the Jewish people under the Greeks. The Greeks, continues the Midrash, said that they forced the Jews to declare to all that we have no portion in the wisdom and the Torah of the God of Israel. This kind of, I think, highlights the big picture disagreement between the Jews and the Greeks. The Greeks, of course, were very advanced intellectually. In fact, the Rambam talks very highly of Aristotle, the, of course, the, the father of, of, of Greek philosophy and wisdom. But here in the verse and in the Midrash, we describe it as darkness, specifically because the Greeks opposed the idea of a divine Torah, of a godly Torah. They were okay with the idea that there is wisdom but they couldn't believe that there's an idea of a godly wisdom. The limits of of human intellect are such in the eyes of the Greeks that it goes a certain distance and no further. And what do we say with the Jewish people? We say, and we announce this on uh, on the prayers, that we made for God a great and holy name in his world. We praise him, we honor him. What, what does that mean? We're showing kind of our opposition, the, the war of this light of the Hasmoneans that they're trying to infuse into the world of darkness of the Greeks is to bring the idea of the Shekhinah, the idea of God, into the world. His great name is here. What? How is it here? That's the core principle and the core contention of the Jewish nation is that we're able to bring the godly wisdom into this world. There are no rigid limitations of darkness imposed upon us by the Greeks. And when we light the candles on Hanukkah, we're supposed to be, think about that, not just about the fact that we're still here. We could think about that. That's a critical component. And about the miracle of the of the flask of oil that lasted for eight days. But also to think about what we represent and what they try to do. They try to quash the light that Torah brings into this world, that we're the, the torch, so to speak, that we're upholding and we're still holding it. We're still infusing light into a world that still has a certain degree of darkness left into it. So happy Hanukkah, everyone. Chach Sameach.